Cool. Okay, let me hear you. Um, okay, so this is a test. Okay. And this is a, a test again. We're testing. We're testing one, two. One, two, three. Nice. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah. what, loud? No, it's not loud. It's not loud enough. I hear it very loud. Yeah. Really? I, I hear, hear it not nice and loud. Because I hear you nice and soft. You can hear me? Yeah, I can I'm hear loud. you. It's very nice and soft. Yeah, but you can hear? Yeah. That's all we need. I can hear both. Yes. You can have a seat, honey. <clears throat> awesome. I hear it very loud. Do you hear us good, man? Yeah, this microphone is bothering me, though. It is? Yeah, it's not. Uh, Can she pull it closer to her? Yeah, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have to do that. Uh, if I crank it up too much. It's going to give. Oh, I know what the problem is. I got it. Oh, um, okay. So we are live. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I know we do things messy anyway, so don't judge me. All right. D. Wow. There we go. Testing one, two. There one, two, three. Go. Testing. Yes. There we go. You can hear her? I can hear her. Yay. Yeah, how about that? We got action. Mm -hmm. And we are live. Hang on a second. I got to go get my. There we go. Drive. This is not. What you gotta go get, man? I was tripping today. Huh? <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Yay, yeah, Sylvia. I see you. Hey. Yes. Hi. I can't camera. see me, but I can see you. I mean, I can't see me good because I'm even with my glasses. That's okay. On. You're gonna love what you do see when you do see. It. Oh god. Oh, it's going to be delightful. Nope. No. Okay, 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 okay. All right, let's see. All right, can you, everybody do a test, please? Backstage being on the last, I'm Nikki Moore. One, two, three. Good? Yeah. And Nikki Moore, I can't wait until you meet Corinda the Cougar, <laughs> who does who calls the people, the women, mother foxes. Mother fox. Yes, mother foxes. They're foxes. They're not their mother foxes. Yeah. <laughs> That's my new hashtag. I just created it. Nobody has it. I'm I like it. Yes. So it might be the thing to do when I when I marry a church man. <laughs> I think, I think that would resolve my need to say the other MF word. Okay, that's what I'm trying to do. Get everybody to start saying, you mother fox. Mother fox. Oh, yes. I think I could stop cursing if I use that. Congratulations. How about that? How about it? Yeah. Dr. Tremor Morrison, you just did it for me. Uh -huh. Hashtag, she did that. <laughs> Hashtag, mother oh, fox. fox. Mother Fox. Yeah. I'm finally going to get famous behind Mother Foxes. I'm telling you, that thing is, my kids, love, my girls who are grown women, they love it. Yes. Love it. All right. So, Corinda the Cougar is the originator of the of Mother, Mother Fox. Fox. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So, no I'm going to um, pull up my doc. Here. Thank you, so Max, you, for being patient with us no problem. today. You're going to do 30, uh, 60 scriptures? Uh, no, I'm going to want to. That was me. I'm going to want to stop for a break. I know. At 30? Yeah, we okay. can do 30. Max, you're so long winded. He's so calm. Usually that's a good thing. Hmm. Every now and then, you got to stop for a break, though, Maxie. You you're, ready? You're rolling. I'm rolling? You didn't even tell me I was rolling. <laughs> okay. Wait, I, I was so caught up in that, I didn't pull up her bio, which I have to do really quickly. You have it on you, right there. That's not it. No, that's not it. No, it's oh. Are you live on Facebook? When yes, I yes. <laughs> they used to that. They used to that. My audience is used to me being a mess because that's what we do. 
right? Hey, Joe Jack. Hey, Jamon Darnell. I'm not going to be okay. saying that on the camera. Can we go? Yeah, I'm pulling up the bio mask. Okay. Sorry. All right. Okay, we can go, Max. Okay. Sorry, we can't go. Here we go. Now we can go. Oh, hold up, hold up, hold up. Let me take this down. It was too much? Yeah, you didn't need the mic for it. Nobody's using it. Oh, okay. Oh, right here. Yeah, no. Okay. Okay, I'm ready. Welcome to Backstage Beyond the Last. I'm Mickey Moore, and we are ready. So buckle up, sit back, and uh, prepare yourself. Can you count me in, Max? <laughs> okay, he is so stone-faced. All right. Welcome to another edition of Backstage Beyond the Last. I'm your girl, Nikki Moore, and we are here today with another very exciting, entertaining interview with one of the most. I'm just not even going to do any of that. I'm going to get right into her story. When is the last time you saw Whoopi Goldberg, Wendy Williams, Monique, Michelle Obama, Cher, Fantasia, and Flotus? Melania Trump together in one evening's performance. Well, all you need to do is catch the Sylvia Traymore Morrison show next time she's around. Originally from Washington, D.C. and currently residing in Maryland, Dr. Sylvia Traymore Morrison is the first renowned Black female impressionist in the history of this great nation. Since impressively hosting Roast of the Chant for Muhammad Ali at the legendary Apollo Theater. Dr. Sylvia was offered a job as an associate writer for Saturday Night Live, the Saturday Night Live. She has performed with countless entertainers, including Jay Leno, David Letterman, Gladys Knight, were the pips there? Robin Williams, Jeffrey Osborne, Jerry Seinfeld, Shaka Khan, Rosie O'Donnell, and the legendary late great Dick Gregory, just to name a few. At the exclusive request of Whitney Houston, Morrison became the opening act for Houston's The Greatest Love World Tour in over 23 cities. Morrison released her first book based on her life entitled Almost There, Almost, The Many Faces of Dr. Sylvia Traymore Morrison, which chronicles her life journey and in her and in, in, in the entertainment industry. That was a little bit of a tongue twister. Because of the rich history, she recently received her first honorary doctorate degree. Sylvia's honors also include the 2013 Living on Laughter Gospel Comedy Association's Lifetime Achievement Award. That was a mouthful also and the Indie Author Legacy Awards, where she received the 2017 Maya Angelou Lifetime Achievement Award. After 50 years in the entertainment business, Dr. Morrison continues to perform in grace stages around the country, lucky for us. Her latest book, Jelly Beans from Heaven, was released in February, 2018, and is garnering conversation across the country. She is amazing. Welcome to Backstage Beyond the Laughs, Dr. Sylvia Traymore Morrison. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank so, you. I'm so excited to be here. I don't even know what to do with myself. I'm with the great Nick and Moore. Yes, yes, yes. I love this lady so much, you guys. 
And uh, nobody, you know, I, I did her intro, but nobody does an introduction like Dr. Sylvia Traymore Morrison. Anytime she introduces me on stage, like I get a standing ovation and I, all I did was walk <laughs> on the stage. Like her whole intro is a performance. I absolutely adore you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Sitting here, you know, I watch you almost every day. Every chance I get, I see you in the morning with Timmy Hall, and I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be just so much fun. And it usually is. Um, but I'm just so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Oh my God. From where you were and where you are now, where you're going. Thank you. Uh, you so know, when I walked into the station today, I, I saw you on the phone, and, and you sounded like a, uh, what do you call it, an improved. Oprah Winfrey. Oh, you no. did not play with whoever it was you were talking to on the phone. You said, like, I need a pen, I need a pen, I need a pen. I mean, you were doing like, you were multitasking <laughs> for you. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. If I could pull that off, it'll be something. Oh, oh well, you were. And, and I, live, it I live to tell that story. <laughs> so I was talking to, I was talking to uh, the Chris Spencer on the phone and thank Ooh. God for him because he is really working uh, a situation out for me that I have been working on for the last few months, but unable to bring into fruition. And it looks like Chris's touch might make it happen. So, yeah, I'm excited. Anyway, let's talk about you. 50 years, Sylvia. 50 years, I'm sorry, Dr. Morrison. 50 years. Yeah, that yeah, that's a small feat. Yeah. 50 yeah. years, Saturday Night Live impressionist still one of the only are you still the only black female impressionist you know what it has pulled in my heartstrings to see i've seen a couple of other women uh black and white doing impressions and may, not many maybe about three that i've seen so far and it just makes me smile to see that you know somebody else has been given that gift a female has been given that gift because what they're doing today uh as opposed to well, I did my very first professional show in Washington, D.C. at Constitution Hall in 1969. Wow. Notice I said first professional show. That's not the first show that I did. Wow. That was, that was the very first real live professional show on a real live stage where people can really recognize it. Because I get tickled when Eddie Murphy says he was the first per black person to appear at Constitution Hall. And I'll be wanting to say, Eddie, no, you aren't. But I mean, you made it popular. You made it, you made it, the, you know, you made it, you put it on the map. But no, sir, you were not the first one. Well, let me tell you, if I have anything to do with it, you're going to get the opportunity to say it so he can hear you. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm going to see to it. But now, you know, if here I go, I got to kiss up a little bit. Um, I love Eddie Murphy. That's not really a kiss up. That's the truth. But I have to say that because... Um, uh, Monique says it best. She was like, Sylvia, you know, a lot of people try to sweep our history under the rug. I'm talking about Monique, the comedian Monique mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. we all know and mm -hmm. who's been around forever. And she's like, it's a lot of things that you've done in 50 years that we give credit to other people for and they don't know that you were there already doing that stuff. That's right. That's so right. It's, it's like, I'm, I'm happy for this newfound... Um, uh, popularity that's that's coming, and I I, I thank God. I, I I really thank him for it because the stuff that's coming up in the near future is, is probably really going to give me some map action. And while I've been around for fifty years, I work with some of the greatest entertainers in the world. I've been um, honored by some of the, the greatest people, but it's like nobody knows because nobody knows that I exist for the mm -hmm. most part. Well, I, I, you know, I have a little oh. fan base, but. I'm talking about the world. The world Nobody will yet. But they will. They will. And and it'll happen in your lifetime. It'll happen before you stop breathing. That's you know what Monique said. We need to do we Monique said, Hey sugar, we need to do this before. You know, you still live in Miss Sylvia, sugar, <laughs> baby. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, like we gotta get you out there while you still here. Okay, yeah. can you answer this question as Monique? Answer this question as Monique. Okay. So how was it the time you met Lauren Michaels? And what did that conversation go like? 
Sugar, let me tell you something, baby. Let me explain this to you right now. Okay? When I met Mr. Michael, he was sitting there, and he was, I'm going I'm to I'm give it to you straight. That's the first white man I met at Saturday Night Live. And he sat there and he told me that every time they did a skit on a black woman, it just went out the door. It was no good. So he needed me, Sylvia, Monique, Sylvia, <laughs> to sit there and help his writers produce a better level of portraying black women. Mm, that's okay, sugar. That is <laughs> everything. I closed my eyes for a minute and I thought I was listening to Monique. She, but, you know, she slithered when we were in Vegas. She slithered down to the ground when I did it. Impressing her, I mean, she literally, literally I slithered. Can't wait to see you and her on the same stage. I'm yeah. trying to make it too. But let me ask you this: so back then was a a a, a really funny time for for um, females in in comedy and entertainment. Period. Right. When you say funny, explain to me because it really wasn't funny per se. Yeah. Based, okay. Unless you tell me what you mean by let me funny. let me explain. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Thank you okay. for that. It was a tumultuous time. It Ooh. was difficult in the industry. Gotcha. I remember hearing Jane Curtin, a white woman, talk about how hard it was for her wow. working mm. alongside John Belushi and oh my God. the others yes. who were horrible to women in yes. the industry. Yes. And I cannot even imagine what it must have been like being a black woman and the only black woman in that industry. Describe for me, for, for our listeners, uh, what a day was like. What was the toughest day? Because I heard you talk about it, but I want to I wanna feel it. What was the toughest day like for you in that time? Let me let me start that. Let me preface that with the fact that Moms Mabley is the true queen of comedy. Mm -hmm. The true. She was out there by herself. Yeah. When I came along, Moms actually died in 1975. So now, when when she, I'm sorry, she died. In, did I say that? Okay. Well, anyway, she died in 1975. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know what I said, but that's what I'm saying now. Um. So when I started doing comedy in the 60s. She was still around. As a matter of fact, my very first house I purchased in Washington, D.C. was across the street, cat corner from Mom's Mabley's house. Mm. So let's start off by imagining that you have the first black female comic in the country across the street from the first black female comic slash impressionist in the country. I thought that was just crazy. Mm. And when I first started, I think God decided to take away any kind of emotional feelings I had about racism and sexism at the time, because I was so young, I didn't understand how horrible it was at that time. Um, it was a white guy's, John, it was a, it was a white guy's industry. And even Joan Rivers and Jane Curtin, Gilda Rad and all these ladies, they talked about it. It mm -hmm. was hard for them. They did not even want to look at a black female coming in. And then I came in dressed up. Mm. My hair was done. Nails done. Nice outfit. They, they thought that was a joke. Wow. You're going to do comedy? Really? Wow. Looking like a, a singer or an actress? You know, that's what they would ask me. Like but I didn't singer. know anybody. I didn't know how to put on a house dress or house shoes or whatever. You know, I always, I always just, I just did. I just got dressed up. I've even heard female comedians today um, expressing how they have seen other women who, who other comics today who dress up really nice and um, they don't know. I've been doing that my entire career for 50 mm. years. So it's yeah. not like I, I just started dressing up. That's That was my whole brand. That was what I did. I couldn't even have a brand though because nobody would let me be seen or uh, here's a prime example, Nikki. Mm. I did uh, six months. In six months' time, I had one club owner to let me open for Rosie O'Donnell. I was on stage for five minutes mm. in six months. Same club owner let me open for Elaine Boozler. I did about seven minutes for Elaine. So in six months' time, they gave me the microphone twice. And that was like huge because they usually gave open mic people three minutes on stage. They wouldn't even let me do three minutes. Wow. I remember going to, in, in D.C., actually, this is when I got back home, and this was in the early 80s. 
I was at a place called um, the Comedy Cafe, and I'd go to Garvin's, and they each let me on one time. Wow. One time. So it got so bad that Andy Evans, I think you know who Andy is. Andy said, Sylvia, you know, it don't make no sense, man. They can let you on the stage for three minutes. But he said, but there's a place up northwest Washington called Ibex. Mm-hmm. He sent me up there. And if you could get through, if you could perform at Ibex and get the audience to like you, whew, you have made it. You don't even never have to do comedy again. If you got through to Ibex, that was like everything. And when I went up to Ibex, I, I was blessed. I was very well received. Now we're talking like 1982, 81, 82. Um, we were in the Marvin Gaye room and, um, Catfish was the host. As a matter of fact, we just did that whole big thing with Tommy Davidson yes. uh, for his, for his uh, Ben's thing. And we laughed and talked about it because I said, if it wasn't for Ibex, because I was accustomed to all white audiences. Mind you, in New York and California, there were no black clubs. There were none. I did all white audiences my whole, the first, during the 20 years of my career. Mm. Now, also, I never got paid the first 10 years that I worked. Never. Except no, the United States sent me to Europe to entertain the American troops. So they paid me for those five weeks. In 10 years, I got five weeks of pay, which I think if I, I could be wrong, I think it was about $500 for the five weeks. So I was picking up $100 a week now. Understand that $100 wasn't so bad back then in the 70s. Early $100 was like, nah. I mean, you know, and then they gave us out, but that was it. Then I got for, for Rosie O'Donnell, when I opened for Rosie, they gave me a Coca-Cola. Hmm. When I opened for Elaine Boozler, they gave me a $5 hmm. bill and a Coca-Cola. Oh that's God. what they gave. That was my pay. Wow. And that's the only time I got paid. And I think when I finally got up to the Ibex, um, I may have gotten, uh, I think it was $50 maybe, which was a joke back then. You know, it was like, Fifty dollars, really, but anyway, it was something, and I, I, I really didn't care if I went for ten years and didn't get paid, because my passion was so deep about what I was doing, and I'm, and I'm thinking that, I, you know, I may need to plug my, sell my iPhone because it says low battery about to okay. cut off. I would just have a fit if it's cut off. I'd be so devastated. Okay, go so, ahead. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was like. <laughs> unbelievable the stories that I could share you know, in my autobiography I write about a couple of stories but I kept a lot of it out because I didn't want people to think I was just an angry black woman all I could talk about was how bad they treated me and then Monique said no you need to tell those stories you need to tell exactly what happened to you coming up as a black woman in comedy because <laughs> it there was I knew no other black women that I could call women period None. I knew no other women in comedy that I could call on the phone. Now, remember, back then, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have none of this new, uh, wonderful stuff that they have today. Thank God I'm still living to witness this, what's happened to the internet and all of the, the internet comedians and so forth. This is like a whole, I've watched six, I'm on my sixth decade of watching comedians. Yeah. And each 10 years, the comics evolve differently. So it's it's been... It's it's been like incredible. So if they the, the the disrespect, the horror that they extended back in the late sixties and the seventies, because back then I did cabarets, birthday parties, house parties on the street corner, uh, the boardwalk, and the like, you know, just all of that. Hmm. There was nowhere for me to perform. Wow. No, that way. is amazing. interesting because. You know, I think that uh, just much, much like the times we live in now, Mm -hmm. millennials, you know, tend to take for granted the struggle. And I found myself for a moment taking for granted the struggle when uh, we, you know, during that morning show thing we do, I made fun of a very serious situation that's happening in your life. Mm-hmm. And, you know, all in the name of humor, right? Right. Mm-hmm. So what what I think that we don't do enough of is acknowledge and honor our our heroes. And Sylvia, I, I, Dr. Morrison, 
Dr. Okay. Trey, you can call me Sylvie. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let me say, I just have to applaud you for not only blazing the trails for, for females in comedy, myself and other women out here, Black females, you know, and just being willing to stand when you stood alone. I remember you saying uh, just a couple of days ago when we spoke that you had a time where you had felt like so horrible about the day you had on the set of Saturday Night Live that you went home and cried, but there was nobody to talk to. Nobody. I cannot imagine. There was, and, and we, the fault, I'm, I'm sorry, Nikki, but I just have to, you know, I'm getting old, so I got to catch you mm -hmm. when, when I have That's a thought fine. about that. It's like, we didn't, I couldn't call because we couldn't afford the long distance telephone calls. Right. You know, the, the whole, the, the, it was just simple. We didn't have cell phones. So when I made a call, it had to be collect because I didn't have any money to pay for my phone calls to home. And even when I did, I couldn't talk about what I was doing because my parents didn't know anything about comedy. Right. My sisters and brothers didn't know anything about comedy. They didn't know the struggle that I had when that white man told me in his club. I went to his club every hmm. Tuesday. I think it was Tuesday or Thursday hmm. because I got a standing ovation every time I went to his club. Mm -hmm. And I remember there were two white girls. They had a, a group called the Rents Do Too, just the two of them. The Rents, you know, the do. Rents Do, you know, like the Renters Do. The Rents two. Do Too. Two that was the name of their little comedy mm -hmm. sketch thing. Mm -hmm. And that man called me into his office, and I was so excited because I said, "Oh my God, they're gonna, he's going to start giving me, he's going to start paying me." Because every week the place was packed. They gave me a standing ovation. I was so excited about it. So he called me in. And he said, Sylvia, I'd like to talk with you. Um, have a seat. So I sat down and, you know, and I'm preparing myself for this wonderful news because I would kill that room every week. And he said to me, looked at me dead in my face, and he said, Sylvia, I'm just going to keep it straight with you, honey. You stink. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I didn't say that. I shower. I mean, he said, no, your comedy is horrible. You are not funny. Your impressions do not sound like the people that you're doing. You just you just need to find something else to do. Why don't you try going to work, getting a job? Wow. And I sat there in total shock. And I said to him, I said, but they give me a standing ovation every week. And when that man said to me, he said, they do that, honey. You're a little colored girl. They feel sorry for you. Wow. Nikki, when I tell you that thing shot my soul shot me in my soul so mm. hard. I'm um, it was like, I mean, this is mm. the place I come to every week. Mm. I come here every week for my safe space. I know that when I get to this club, I'm going to be okay because they're going to the audience is going to love me. Mm. And when he said that, it wasn't until months later that I realized that was his way of putting me out of his club. He was sick and tired of this little black girl coming in here, stealing his stage from the other people. This is what I put in my mind to make me feel better about it. But the fact that he told me that I stunk and that my comedy wasn't funny and that I should find a job, try to do something else, because this was not the business for me. I went home and I'm telling you, I sat, I sat down. And his words kept repeating over and over my head. And I almost quit. I almost quit. Almost oh. did. Hmm. Then I thought, I don't have anything else to do. So what I got to do is get better. Hmm. And I started getting better and better to a point where when they were roasting, when they had the, when I saw where they were roasting Muhammad Ali, I had already been to Europe and been, you know, I had people that had seen me over in Europe who, the, the the men and women in, in the armed forces thought I was magnificent. And um, I said, I got I to gotta do that, Muhammad Ali Rose. I have to do it. And so I planned to crash the roast. And I was going to do my impression of, um, oh, what's her name? She used to be on the show uh, at Laughing. Ruth Bussy. Ruth Bussy. I said, I'm going to do my impression. I'm going to be a black Ruth Bussy. I'm going to crash the roast. And they're going to let me on that roast because I have to. I have, I used to have to do stuff because mm -hmm. otherwise there were there were no platforms for me to work on. Right. And, and there were no the, you talked about the time there were no black women for you to uh no. impersonate. None. There were like, mm -hmm. well, 
by that time, Donna Ross had come along, mm. and then Tina Turner had come along. But I was still doing my Wackos. I was still doing Jane Hathaway. I was still doing Catherine Hepburn. I was still doing um, Joan Rivers. I was doing uh, oh, what's her name? Uh, oh, you know the the, the B author yeah. and uh, those people. <laughs> but yeah, Maud. And it was like I, I'd gone to visit my friend in San Antonio. He played for the San Antonio Spurs, and I got a call from the girl who I went to Europe with, Miss Black America. She had talked to Dick Gregory and convinced him, since Richard Pryor had called and canceled coming that day, that you can get, because they didn't have anybody that could fill in for Richard Pryor. Mm. Nobody. And so she convinced him. She said, this girl went to Europe with us. She turned Europe all the way out, upside down. She killed Europe. you got to bring her in. So Dick Gregory, this is why I love Dick Gregory so much. And you, I'm sure you've heard this story before, Nikki, because I tell it all the time I, in I, order to I, pay I, my homage to and respect day. to Dick Gregory. He said, okay, bring her in. So when she called me in Texas and, and said, you need to get on the next plane coming to New York, because guess what? You're hosting the Muhammad Ali Rose. I, y'all might as well just got a casket and put me in it and just let me go ahead on and die because I was like, what did you say? <laughs> and sure enough, I got on that plane and I made it back and it was on fire from that moment. I was like, oh my God. Give us a little taste of that. Okay, well, first of all, when I had to introduce Mr. Ali, um, you know, Muhammad Ali joked with everybody. Everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if, and I was probably the only person, and I don't know if my little lady, I was 26 years old. I was 26 years old replacing Richard Pryor. Okay. And I'm the only woman, black, white, Chinese, Asian, I'm sorry, Chinese people, um, Latinos, I'm the only woman so far that has ever hosted a major roast. There have been women who have roasted people, famous people, but mm -hmm. none have hosted it. And I just found that out about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. So people went to, you know, my folks, my historians went to do their, check their history and find out if that was the truth. And they said, you know what, Sylvia? Nope. We haven't found anybody that's actually hosted a roast. So there we were. Everybody was there. Nikki, when I tell you all of so many NFL players, basketball players, you got the, the, the daggone um, stars. This was Muhammad Ali. He was at the height of his career. Everybody was there. It was standing room only. And there I was, no script, no nothing. I had to come out there on that stage and, and, and just handle it. Hmm. And when I, I, when I introduced Dick Gregory, which was not a big intro like you know me to do, but it was enough that the people, if you ever, I, I, I have that tape. Thank you, God, they provided me. Iwari gave me a copy of that tape. Mm. He and his mom, they were the ones whose husband was in charge and blah, 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 mm. blah. But the, the intro for Dick Gregory was so nice that his family used that tape for the uh, Dick Gregory movie that they're bringing out this year. I am Dick Gregory at the uh, March on Washington Film Festival last year. Nice. They showed that tape. So it's like, thank God I have that, because back then we didn't have all of that. That was at Arena Stage, right? Did I? No, that was at um, um uh, down the, at the uh, Naval. Oh, okay, the Naval Center. Memorial. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. that's where they had that. So they you they actually used that. They used it, and that was in nineteen um, seventy nine. When Muhammad Ali was roasted, 1979, and I was telling somebody the other day, I said I hadn't seen Mr. Gregory in so many years. When I did, they called me to open for him at the riot act, mm -hmm. and he looked at me and he said, "Sylvia, mm -hmm. we thought you were dead." I said, "You just always, just always saying something." He said, "I laughed so hard." He said, "Well, we haven't seen you in years. We wondered what happened to you." I said, I've been around. I've been running the country. I've been running around the country. Running the country like I'm doing. <laughs> you could. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Who's running it now? But Question. that was um that was the night that Garrett Morris came over to me and said, You need to meet my boss. Uh, and his boss was Lauren Michael at Saturday Night Live. And sure enough, he kept his word. He took me over to NBC. I met Mr. Michael and he offered me a position as an associate writer for Saturday Night Live. And and, and Monique is funny. She's like, 
Hey, Sylvia, I, I don't know why. You know, we don't know that. People need to know that. They are trying to sweep you up under the country, I mean, up under the rug, sweetie, but not in this country. So, <laughs> I know that's right. Thank goodness for that. And the play awards, because otherwise you wouldn't have ran into her. Isn't that the truth? Yes. yes. Isn't we got to take a break. Uh, and when we come back, I want to um, read some questions. So okay. some of our uh, online viewers have questions and we'll, we'll answer those out loud. Also, what I want to know when we, when we come back is I want to talk about your honorary doctorate degree because that's huge. Yeah. And I yeah. don't know anything about that in any of the things that you do. And I want you. So let's get into it. You're listening to Backstage Beyond the Laughs. This is DC Radio, and I'm Nikki Moore. Back in a moment. No words, Max? No, this is going well. Okay, good. Do we have any tissue? I need to. uh, Okay, she's getting you some. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's um, the easiest to interview. So I want to tell the online viewers, please write some questions for uh, Dr. Morrison. We want to ask, answer those questions, and I'll read them out and show them on screen. You can't see them on the radio, but you can you see. You know, I forgot we were on. <laughs> oh, um, my God, y'all. How's everybody doing? <laughs> oh, yes. You mother foxes. I tell you. <laughs> yeah, I she don't use curse words. I no. And yeah. and you know what, Nikki? The other thing is, back then, women. When I first saw women, didn't even wear pants. Women didn't wear pants. No, they we they, we couldn't wear pants. Uh, no. So thank that's... you, thank you, Morgan. So yeah. that was why Moms Mabley wore house dress. Women did not wear pants in public. It's just uh, that simple. And mom... not only for the stage people, but for young women. You know, period. We couldn't wear them to school. None of that. Wow. No. Moms Mabley, uh, also, people don't really know, they didn't talk about Moms Mabley was a lesbian. Yes, she was. And you know what? Good for her because no, good for her. She, she, <laughs> okay. she braved all kind of, I mean, she talked about kicking indoors. Yes. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, back then in the, in the, in the 50s and the 60s, mm-hmm. she was a lesbian. And she would put on her suit. Unheard of. She would Put yeah. her there and she would wear pants mm-hmm. out, you know, and she, she didn't care. Sure did. She did not care. That woman did not care. She put her suit on and she marched herself around with her girlfriend. I am so I never got a Your phone is ringing. It'll, it'll stop. It'll stop. Yeah. That's probably somebody that was just calling, listening to the show, trying to call me on the phone, not realizing. <laughs> are, yeah. we, are we okay? We good. I can still see you. Oh, okay. Cool. So yeah. I'm sorry I never got a chance to meet Moms Mabley. Um, it would have been an honor for me. Yeah. It would have been an absolute honor for me because if I went through what I went through, I can't even think, I can't even perceive her being in the chitlin circuit because that's what they called it back then. Mm, okay. It was the chitlin circuit because she couldn't play in a lot of the clubs that uh, no. weren't really that many comedy clubs. No, but no. even in shows, she couldn't like, for instance, how about this? Monique's residency is at the L- SLS, as you right. all know, because you've been there. Mama. That's the same club that Sammy Davis Jr. played in when he was playing bass. He had a residence. The only place he could play. And he couldn't even come in uh, the same way as the yes. other people. He had to come in. Well, not only bed. that, he couldn't stay at that hotel. Everybody else went up to their rooms and Sammy okay. had to leave. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. No, I was just saying he couldn't even stay at the same hotel. Sammy had to leave. He, he was not allowed to stay in the hotel. So I'm I'm happy for Monique. I'm happy for Eddie. I'm happy for Lunell. Um, uh, you know, it's it's it's. That was, that I know was Lunell is doing her uh, last Sunday uh, at SLS this Sunday coming, 
And I wish I had known that. So much is happening, so many places. And I just, um, I wish I had known. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that either. So we talked to, before I mean, we come back mm -hmm. live, Nikki. we're online. We're talking to Dr. Sylvia Traymore Morrison. And this is DC Radio. And please write some questions for her. She is an amazing comedy veteran. She blazed trails for women in comedy, black women in comedy, and women in entertainment, writing, producing, and first year. Uh, I need questions. <laughs> okay. I can ask. I can ask myself a question. Hey, Sylvia. No, I'm only kidding. Then we need that. We need you guys. Well, we know you can do it too. You know I will. I'll do them in different voices and everything. I'll bring it down. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Let's do you it. You know what? Oh, I don't know if we're back on, but I wanted you to know. I saw you on the uh, Braxton Family <laughs> Value. I was like, oh my god! I, I saw it just today because I record their show. Yeah. I DVR their show. And I'm standing up there looking, and I'm a, I will tell you this, Nikki. When I see women in comedy do, doing it big, like watching you, it just made me smile. Because I remember a time that that, where that just wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. You were not going to be on TV. And to see you up there bossing yeah. and just, you know, being, being the boss that you are. You know, I just said that. I actually rewound it twice. I have so you I to watch it. That. Okay, um, we're going to come back. I said, I have you to thank for that. So, um, you ready? Yeah. Just go in. I no, can't no. get it. I can't you, get a You can, but you need to push your mic back a little bit. Oh, okay. you, know, you, you know it throws me off when you don't. Know. Is that good? Where are yeah, you going? Just stay right there. Okay. okay. Come back. All right, let me. You got to stay on that mic, though. Is that good? Yeah. It's perfect. That's perfect. I will stay here. You got to make because otherwise you'll be off mic when you go over here. I see. You have to be right in. So bring it. In. Yeah, I know it gets in your face. <laughs> uh -huh. You want me to stay on it now? Yeah, stay right on it. Stay right on it. Don't let up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't let up. I got to work for it. Right there. <laughs> Almost there. Almost. <laughs> okay, let's do this. We are back. Backstage Beyond the Labs, I'm Nikki Moore, and we're talking to Dr. Sylvia Traymore Morrison, the country's first ever Black female impressionist. In, impersonator, impressionist, not impressionist. impressionist yeah, impressionist, because female impersonator. I think that would have been RuPaul. No, I'm just kidding. No, the first <laughs> ever black female impressionist, Dr. Sylvia Traymore Morrison. Um, let's come back to the honorary doctorate degree you earned from Breakthrough Bible College and Theological Seminary. I know that yes. from our yes. heart because our producer <laughs> is always squeamish that somebody's going to let out a good MFR and it's not the good <laughs> one, not the fox. <laughs> My love foxes. <laughs> yes. Oh. That's going to help me stop cussing though. Thank you for that. Yes. Well, um, you know, I, I was actually doing a radio show one day over on the harbor, mm -hmm. and um, a guy by the name of Dr. Anthony Mays, who is the nephew to Benjamin Mays, who used to be president of Morehouse College, mm -hmm. and you know, Dr. Mays is like a, a big deal. Mm -hmm. And um, after the show, he came in the door and he just looked at me and stared at me, and he said, "I've never heard of you. That's phenomenal." The life that you've had, and at that time it was maybe about 46, 47 years. He said, are you a doctor? Mm. I said, no, I'm not. I haven't, I haven't been to school. I haven't earned. He said, no, no, no. You've been to school. You've been in school for 40 some years. They need to give you an honorary doctor's degree. The same way they gave Oprah one and Maya Angelou one. And he even said Bill Cosby. He, and, you know, he just said, you deserve to be honored with a doctorate. And he said, I'm going to make that happen. Yes. And I was like, seriously? 
Yeah. And before I knew it, um, he had gathered all the information he needed. You know, we I had to submit all these papers and uh, letters of recommendation and uh, the whole nine yards, just like you would almost almost do when you're receiving your Ph.D. And I got about 10 people to write character letters and um, recommendation letters. I had all the forms filled out. We did this. We did that. And uh, they got together everything for me. And during graduation, they had me to come in and presented me with the with an honorary doctor's degree. And I was I was like the third black female comic to receive that because Cheryl Underwood has one. um, And there's I can't think of the woman's name in Florida. She received one from her university. And then there's me. So I don't know who else. If anybody else has one, I don't know about them. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how that, that came about. So I was just so tickle pink that I would have never dreamed that little seven year old girl who used to hear crickets and make cricket sounds in my house and imitate all kind of car sounds and light sounds and people in the neighborhood would be receiving an honorary doctorate's degree because I did comedy for all those years. How did you first I, I heard your story and, and that experience always gets me. How did you first discover, like when you knew that you could imitate a cricket and you just continued to delve into that and discovering your ability is like discovering that you have a gift. Yeah. It's really discovering that you have a gift. You know, you, I, I mean, like what happened? Well, I remember being angry with God. Mm. I was mad with God because everybody could do something special except for me. My girlfriend could jump double dutch like a queen. I had another girlfriend who could run like the wind. Another friend of mine was like a violinist and she was just magnificent. She was so classy. She got that violin and she just just made music to everybody's ears. I went and got me a violin. Mm. And my older sister used to almost cry. Because she would tell my mother, she's making so much noise. Nobody can sleep with her. Nobody can do anything. And my mother said, let her play. Because that's all, all I had. Because I think my mother kind of knew I was angry. That I, I was trying so hard to just do everything. And then one day, one day I I, I heard a, a beat. It was like, there's a bumblebee around here somewhere. And I told my sister, I said, there's a bumblebee coming. I hear him. She said, you don't hear no bumblebee. You're always talking about stuff you hear. And I didn't know that I had been talking about stuff that I hear. But no sooner than she said that, this big old ugly black, big, you know, the black bumblebees, it's got the big bodies. That That's suckers black, came and flew right jacket. by us. And I said, that's it. I told you it was a bee. I told you. And then my next experience was, um, I didn't know that I was hearing these sounds, but I heard a a couple of butterflies coming. I heard them. I don't know how I heard them. I don't know if it's, I heard them. I heard the sound of them. But I knew that there were bumblebee. I'm sorry, butterflies in the area. Yeah. So I told her, I said, it's a couple of butterflies nearby too. Mm. And sure enough, the prettiest orange and yellow black butterflies mm. just flew right past us. And I mm. said, oh my God. And then I could hear, I remember the crickets. They just... They got on, they made me a little like annoyed because they just kept making noise. Mm. So I figured, and I rarely tell, tell this part myself, I figured if I started making the same sounds, they would quit. So I'd come in my house at night and do cricket sounds, and my parents thought that there were crickets in the house. And they couldn't believe it when they found that it was me. Mm. Then I started being able to imitate people in my neighborhood. Because I, I'm like, I can see it. I can just about do you, Nikki. I haven't perfected you, oh, yeah. but I can, I'm can. i going to be able to do one day when we're doing a show together. Me. Oh, I'm going to get you on stage and do you. Oh, that is Give me what you've been practicing. Huh? Give me what you've been practicing. Hit me with, no, I got, it's got to be. Oh, my I, I, God. I don't have unless wait. they are spot on. Because I, I don't want people saying, wait. they don't sound like Nikki to me. No. <laughs> when I do Nikki, they're going to say, oh, my God. <laughs> you have a very distinct sound. Your yeah. voice is different. You talk a little bit through here, through your nose. I do. Yes, you do. Yeah. And that's part yeah. of you. If, if that wasn't happening, that wouldn't be Nikki Moore. Uh-huh. So anyway, I started imitating my teachers and the principal and people would come and get me. And I'm a little girl. I'm like seven, eight, 
nine years, you know, and that maybe even early. I don't know. But um, they would come and get me and say, do so and so, do so and so. And I would do the teacher, whoever they were asking me to do. And they were like, oh, my God, you sound just like her. <laughs> and so then I started seeing people on TV like mm -hmm. Ed Sullivan. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time I decided I could do an impression of Ed Sullivan. And for the for the people who have no idea who Ed Sullivan is, he was kind of like the Oprah. Can you still do it? You know what? I haven't done him in maybe 35 years. Olympic show. <laughs> that was yeah, exactly. That was Olympic show. You know, he, he was he was <laughs> he was like the Oprah of those days, the 60s and the 70s and so forth. And then I realized I could do Jane Hathaway from the yeah, Mr. Clover, Jethro, Ellen I. You know, it was like, oh, I, that was like a priest. But there was nowhere, Nikki, for me to do this stuff. Oh. There was no, there were no stages for me to get on mm -hmm. and do this. So I had to do house parties, cabarets, mm -hmm. on the street, around folks, picnics, yeah. cookouts, that kind of stuff. You know, it's funny you say that about the stages because... I uh, have been when, you know, I spent time in, in these past couple of weeks in Vegas mm -hmm. with uh, Michael Williams, who was the creator of the Comedy Act Theater. I love him. I and love him. Mm -hmm. the first ever Black comedy club chain in America. Right. And it is the reason that we have such an explosion of organized Black comedy today. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. comedians, yourself not included, but most of the comedians who we know in, in, in urban comedy and black as black comedian, movie stars, entertainers from that realm mm -hmm. are so because of Michael Williams and the Comedy Act Theater. Right, right. And I, um, I don't think that people realize that this is only since 1985. In yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. Absolutely. I yeah. cannot imagine. And it, it's been difficult even since then. You listen to other females like Cheryl Underwood and, you know, some of the others, Lunell and uh, people, Monique, who talk about the the strides that, that, that they've made in comedy, you know, since starting. People don't realize mm -hmm. how short a span it's been. Yeah, it's, it wasn't that long ago. As a matter of fact, thank God that Michael... Uh, came up with his concept mm -hmm. because I don't know where comedy would be today. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't know where it would be. Right. And he hadn't, if he hadn't come up with, it was, I think he may have been one of the first, I know in DC we had the Ibex, mm -hmm. but that was not an exclusive comedy club no. like he created. Exactly. He created exclusivity. That's, I, I love that word when I said it because I sound like I know what I'm talking about. I know. But yeah. at any rate, he was, um, I, I just don't know where comedy would be if he wasn't uh, thinking to bring that to the surface. So, Mr. Williams, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your contribution to comedy. I never made it to your club, but I knew all of it. I was touring. By that time, God had blessed me with some magnificent, amazing, amazing, amazing tours. Uh, in 86, I was with Whitney Houston um, for 23 cities. She decided, She picked me up. I opened for her in D.C., and I remember when I opened after my show, she came up to me. This is Whitney Houston. She was like the Beyonce of her day, for those of you, because I even know a couple of my grandkids' kids have no clue who a Whitney Houston is. I'm like, excuse me, hello? She was like the Beyonce of her day, and they're like, oh. Then they go, oh, wait a minute, we know who Whitney Houston is. Yeah, okay, thank you. But um, she came up to me after my set, and she stopped me, and she said, you know what? When I go on tour, I'm going to take you with me. I'm going to take you with me. And I was like, oh, my God, how cool would that be for me to be able to? That would be like if Beyonce came up to me today and say, Sylvia, I'm going to take you on tour with me. It would be like, first of all, you're not going to believe it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't believe Whitney was going to take That was Whitney Houston winning Grammys in American music, just doing stuff. And sure enough, when her tour started, she didn't take me because... I guess her people or whoever, mm -hmm. they didn't want another black female on tour with her. So they got a white guy who mm -hmm. was on Star Search. Wow. And by the way, I reneged on Star Search to, to go on tour with Whitney. I'll tell you, tell you that in a hot second. Mm -hmm. So he went on tour. And of course, Whitney at the time was playing to mostly white audiences. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, I told you my first 10 years basically was in front of white audiences. 
So mm. I knew how to work them. I knew how to do that. Mm. Uh, because they're very polite anyway. White audiences are very polite. And yes, they are. You go to them black audiences, baby. You better, yeah. you better try to bring it. That's oh, you what you better do. Yeah. And, and um, so when he didn't fare as well as she wanted him to, she said, call Sylvia. Mm. So they called me out on the road. My first night with her, I'll never forget it, was in uh, Long, uh, Long Island, New York. And we were at an amphitheater. Uh -huh. And I remember it went so well. One of her agents, so who I know who it was, and I don't want to say his name because I don't want no y'all finding me. Huh? He's still agenting. <laughs> yeah, well, he was he was he was well, he was somebody no, that, with agents right now. Uh, yeah. That whole uh, exchange that you walked in on was, you know, some agent. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think he told me overrated and unnecessary BT dub. Wow. Okay. Go well, ahead. He he told me that that night after I performed, we we'll, and I forgot exactly how I said it, but it's in my book. And he said to me, um, "We'll make a decision whether or not we're going to keep you on the tour." Mm. And I'm like, "Well, I'm thinking, I'm out here thinking that I'm coming out on the tour." Mm. But now they're telling me they'll let me know if I'm going to stay. I didn't just drop my whole life thinking I'm going on tour. Mm -hmm. So now I got the whole, all the anxiety the whole night of whether or not they're going to keep me for the next show, you know, whether or not I'm going to go on the tour. And I later learned that Whitney said, of course she's going on the rest of the tour. You saw what <laughs> she did tonight. Of course she's going. And I was like, oh, God, thank you. And so I, I remained on the, on the tour. Yeah. And having worked like that with her, I, I remember in my bio, you said for Gladys Knight, we're, we're, yeah, you know, we're the pips, pips with her. Yeah. Yes, they were. Yeah. That's the pips. I was with Gladys Knight and the pips. Yes, I was. It was during the time before she went alone. So I toured with them just for a couple of dates. And I was I went on the road with Jeffrey Osborne. I uh, I was doing shows with Shaka Khan, Stephanie. You know, you you read it all in, in, the, uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in the bio. And so while Michael Williams was mm -hmm. conducting making comedy the biggest thing in the country, I was out on the road. I never got a chance to go there. But I know so many comics who speak so highly of him and his brand and what he did for comedy back then. And so when I finally got a chance to meet him through you, thank you, it was like a, like a privilege and honor. He's a wonderful guy. He really mm -hmm. is. And I know that um, there, ha I can't wait until that story is told. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it'll be soon. But I know that um, much like what you have expressed to me, we take so much for granted. His existence is so important to our culture. You know, I, I liken the Sylvia Traymore Morrisons and the Michael Williams of our time to some of the chief architects who, you know, just laid the foundation of, of our, our existence. You know, some of the people who blazed the trail during the civil rights movement and things like that. Entertainment is such a very important part of our fiber. Uh, comedy, music. Absolutely, music. yes. Uh, Max Myrick, he's gonna come on the show one day. And uh, some, of, some of this this culture and this history is just so rich. And I think that we do our youth a, a, a serious a disservice mm -hmm. by not telling these stories and not um, just um, amplifying the, the platforms of, of these architects, such as you and Max and Michael, and people who created this space for us is very important. Is very important, and I want to see the story. I know I'm not alone in it. Mm -hmm. I know so many people want to know this stuff. Like, yeah. what was it like to sit next to Diana Ross and have a conversation or be roommates with George Wilborn or, you know, things like that, that every individual just simply cannot say they've done in a lifetime. Right. Did you, did I, did I tell you, did I ever express to you, I think I did, that, um, Red Fox was my very first manager. Yes, let's talk about that. Yes, it Tell was that, like how did that come about? That was the craziest thing ever because um like I said when I went to Europe to entertain the American troops, 
I actually tied in the Miss Black America pageant. I've tied with Bernadette Stannis, who is Thelma from Good Times. Good Times. <laughs> Temporary layoff. Good Times. And uh, that night that we tied, and by the way, you know, I, well, I ended up beating her out. But that night she got a card. She 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 beat everybody out because she got a card to go and audition for Good Times. Wow. In the meantime, they sent me to Europe. Now to make this story a, a long story short, um, we were over there killing it in Europe. Um, it ended up being only two of us left because two of the girls, two of the contestants, had to come back home for various reasons. So it was just me and our niece, who was Miss Black America, and. Um, we were being chaperoned by a guy named Charles Brown, who was the manager for a group called The Taste of Honey. Mm-hmm. They they won a Grammy for We Gonna Boogie Oogie Oogie Till You Just Can't Boogie No More. Yes. And so he came and told me, he said, Sylvia, got somebody want to meet you back home. Because again, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have none of that stuff. Uh, he had heard about me on the radio. Uh, European television stuff that people talked about, magazines, that whole bit, telephone. So when I got home, they flew me out to California to meet this guy. And the guy was Red Fox. Hmm. And he gave me a contract right there on the spot. I'm so young and silly and I don't even know what to I just signed the contract. I ain't give it to no lawyer. I ain't do nothing. It was Red Fox here. Whatever it is on this contract, I'm signing it. Period. Hmm. And, and, and that's what I did. Um, I, I didn't know anything about nothing. I couldn't call home. There was nobody in my family or none of my friends that knew anything about the entertainment industry. Nobody. Yeah. I wouldn't have known who to call if I did know somebody to call. The only friend I had at the time in the industry was Dewey Hughes, mm-hmm. who was the executive producer of the Miss Black America pageant, uh, the local division mm-hmm. for NBC, because that's where they, they did the um, the pageant. NBC picked up the rights to it, but that was it. And when I did call, he gave me some valuable information, but I couldn't keep calling that them those folks that that uh, long distance calls. Or it was like three dollars and some change for one minute every time you made a phone call. So it was it was crazy. So Mr. Fox signed me up on the spot. So how long did he manage you? Uh, thirty five years was in the contract. I later learned. <laughs> <laughs> So, so safe to say, you didn't get free from that until he dropped dead. <laughs> well, you know what? The crazy thing is, I just found a woman who <laughs> may have a copy of the contract because she kind of like ran his company and she's still here. And I said, I know that they've got some archives with those contracts and so forth in it. But I specifically look, remember looking at it and it said something about after a certain amount of years, it, it all ended up to be in about 35 years I was under contract with him. Wow. I can't imagine that. <laughs> yeah. So and, what about, what about um, like when he was still a comedian, he was a working comic at that time. Yes. He was not managing yes. anybody, but he obviously saw the talent in you and the opportunity in your talent. So wh- what about the contract that you guys were able to separate from? Because he didn't stay in active management of your career. No, no, he, he really didn't. And when they found out my dad was dying and I had to come back home, mm. you know, they gave me the, the run of whatever I needed to do because they weren't really. Here's the problem, Nikki. Mm-hmm. Back then, again, black women were not given the same microphone experience, television experience, radio experience, magazine experience. We weren't given that like we are today. Mm -hmm. So they knew it would be kind of difficult unless I was doing television. One of his clients was also LaWanda Page. We were under the same umbrella that Red Fox had. Mm -hmm. Now LaWanda had room to grow because uh, well, she was LaWanda Page and plus she was on the Red, she was on Sanford and Son. And hi, Morgan. <laughs> Sorry, I was just waving to Morgan. Mm-hmm. And so it was. Um, it oh, was not. God. It was just not the same feel as it is today. You know, it was a. It was a problem getting work for a young black female comic who did impressions. 
Well, nobody trying to hire nobody like that. They just didn't know. They they couldn't figure out what to do with me. Wow. They just couldn't. Okay, she does impress him. She's funny. She's this. She's that. And then also, the fact that there was no real platform for you. Right. To, uh, exactly. Didn't help. It me. was all about the passion and the love and the desire and the need. I recognized I had a gift. And I knew that God would not forget me with this gift. He didn't give it to me just for me to be just flying along doing nothing. And I still believe that to this day. You know, it's like so much when you when when the public, when this country hears and sees the stuff that's coming up in the next two, three, four months, it's it's probably going to be like one of the biggest blessings I've ever encountered. You I'm know, super excited. I cannot yeah. wait. Thank you. Literally, I cannot wait to see it. So, um, I just want to I want to move quickly into your book, and then there's one question that we ask everybody that comes on to the show. Uh huh. Describe the first time you bombed. Okay, the first time I bombed mm -hmm. was in Los Angeles, California. I used to go because I didn't have a platform because there was nowhere to go. I would find like. Like I heard one night, the Temptations were at this club. Mm -hmm. And I had the gift of gab at the time, even as a young, quiet, mm -hmm. I was very quiet back then. But I could talk when it came to me doing a show. Mm -hmm. So I went into this club. They were giving the Temptations some kind of award. And it was like a local, like a personal club. It was upfront, intimate. You know, it wasn't a big show. And the Temptations were on the show. It was like a, just a regular club where they were dancing and drinking and doing everything. Oh, God, how painful was this? So I went in and I talked to the people and I said, if you could just let me go on for just a few minutes, I'm fine. If you like me, bring me back. And if not, you know, I'm good. Mm -hmm. So I did not know that they had already been at the, everybody had already been at the bar three or four times. The place was completely drunk. <laughs> temptations hadn't even come out yet. They were waiting for the temptation. Ooh. And they announced, this is in you've been in the bars where everybody's talking, ain't nobody paying attention. Everybody hey, I've got this girl. She uh, she says she can do imitations of people. Uh, what, what's your name? Even, Sylvie? even the roaches what? be drunk. <laughs> oh, the, the, everybody was in the sideways across the road. Completely drunk. It was like, so I went on the stage, Nikki, and when I tell you. <sighs> That not one, no, there was one person that listened to me because she hollered out. I'll never forget it as long as I live. I was like devastated. She hollered out, oh, y'all get a girl a chance. <laughs> and I'm out there slowly dying in front of everybody. And I could not believe it. I never died like that. Never. I said, oh, my God. So, you know, I, I couldn't even talk. And I'm like, and, and thank, thank you all so very, very. And I ran off that stage. Ran home and closed the door behind myself and said, "Oh no, that can never happen. Again. That is hilarious. ever in life, ever." Hilarious. And I started working on my set. I said, "It's got to be stronger. It's got to be stronger." And sure enough, I worked on it so good. So when I finally went to the comedy store mm -hmm. in L.A., mm -hmm. that's where I met Robin Williams and Jay Leno and David and that crew. They were not famous then. We we're talking about the 70s. Yeah. They were not yeah. famous at all. Because Nobody knew who exactly they up. were or me. And I remember going in and um, the uh, they let me on stage. I think I was like number 19 or something at the comedy store. When I came off that stage, because I worked on my set, I worked because I was never going to let that happen again. And I have not to this day. I had one event that I can remember where I almost bombed, but I picked it up and brought it back to life. Almost because I was just not. But at any rate, when I went on the, the, the stage at the comedy store, when I came off, Mitzi Shore, who was the woman at the time that it was her play, she ran and she decided what comics would come on. She called me over and at that time. Oh, and by the way, Mitzi Shore, Polly Shore's mother. Polly Shore's mother. Henry Jones, at the time I was using the name Bunny, Bunny Morrison. Yeah. That's where Henry Jones from yesterday. When yeah, I, watched it, I, I, I yeah. saw that. I, I saw my that nickname funny. is Bunny. That's what my nickname yeah. is. You motherfucker. <laughs> 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 and so she said, Bunny, we loved you. We'd love for you to come back. 
And she said, you know, we don't have that many women that come in. So that said to me that there were some other female comics around. I just didn't know them. I just didn't know them. But I don't think it was any black ones. Yeah. I didn't see them out there at that time. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's that's what that was. What, what are you laughing for, Nick? I'm laughing at Bunny because yeah. when he said it, I was like, who in the universe is Bunny? He yeah. said only him and Tony Woods knew you as Bunny. I said, oh, my God, I don't know what it is, but I just got out of trouble with Sylvia. I'm not getting <laughs> ready to say nothing about it. I was like, you know, okay. Because Bunny might have, he talked about Bunny was your street name. <laughs> oh, my God. No, Bunny was my nickname. That's what, because when, this story is in my book. When I grew, when I was first born, my father thought I looked just like a bunny rabbit. So he tried to call me Cottontail. Yeah, I can see and that. My father, and my sister was like, you cannot curse her with that name, Cottontails. If she looks that much like a rabbit, call her Bunny. And you know, when I you do uh, your um, Dion Warwick impression, you do like a little bunny face. It's hilarious. <laughs> we got like two minutes before we got to get out of here. But could you uh, leave with this, with your Dion Warwick impression? And before you do that, though, we didn't touch on your book, so you have to come back. Would you please promise to come back so we can just sure, talk about Nikki. it? And I want to know what's next for Dr. Sylvia Traymore Morrison. And I also want you to come back and talk about your ministry. We have well, one minute. I'll, so, I'll tell you what's next. I'm headed down to the Peachtree Comedy Festival in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, that's um, June the 18th through the 22nd. Um, I'm also going to be in Vegas back with Monique on her residency at the SLA, okay. uh, June the 6th, 7th, and 8th, which I just feel like, I, I feel like my Whitney Houston days from back then. Oh. And uh, because Monique is like all of that. I mean, she, her yeah. show is amazing. I have, uh, I'm doing the Remembering Ali documentary at the Magic Theater here in Washington, D.C. That is June the 4th. And it's, it's you know, it's got, got a lot of nice stuff coming up. Awesome. <laughs> I can't do the DR because I think we're about to. No, Oops. do it. Okay, do it. ladies and gentlemen, thank you, thank you, thank you so very, very much. It's been a treasure and an honor, and an honor to have been here with Nikki and Max and Morgan and the whole team. I want to just say, what do you get with all in love? Only get lies at the at sorrow. So for at least until tomorrow, I'll, I'll see you next time, Nikki Moore. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! Dr. Sylvia Traymore Morrison, thank you so much for joining us backstage beyond the laughs. Your story is amazing, and it's certainly not enough time to be able to hear all the many facets of Dr. Sylvia Traymore Morrison in this one hour. So we're going to have her back to, so we can unfold a few more of these layers. You are amazing. I cannot say it enough. I thank you. I honor you. I, I appreciate you. And I love you. Thank you so much for being thank a part you. of my life. Thank and you. Thank you very much. Show. So this has been Backstage Beyond the Laughs. I'm Nikki Moore. We're right here following the oxygen each and every week on DC Radio. That was good. Oh, yeah. Really? Oh, really? Oh, Max I knew it said it was good. It it so let's wrap this live up. We still on the live. Are we still on live? Yes, yeah, so we're going to get out of here. We didn't get no questions, but we got a lot of people. Thanks for the viewers who tuned in. Um, I She's so captivating. It's hard to like stop and think about anything. You just want to hear her. So thank you again, Dr. Sylvia Traymore Morris. For thank you. On Backstage Beyond the Last. Thank you, Mac, our amazing producer and uh, all around everything here at DC Radio. We uh, appreciate you being patient. Max does not dig when I do this technology mess, but it's important. <laughs> so and thank you, Monroe, my amazing assistant. We are going to wrap this thing up. This has been Backstage Beyond the Last. We're back next week. Peace. Catch me and Timmy tomorrow. Yay. <laughs> <laughs>